Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Mirte Getreida Elisabeth Velte will defend the academic thesis journeying towards sustainable business models on the collaborative shaping, shifting and redesign of organizational boundaries for sustainable business model innovation. May I invite you to present the summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. The floor is yours. Thank you. Dear Pro-Rector, members of the Corona family, friends and colleagues, thank you for being here today for the presentation of my thesis entitled Journeying Towards Sustainable Business Models on the Collaborative Shaping, Shifting and Redesign of Organizational Boundaries for Sustainable Business Model Innovation. You might wonder what I have been doing in the past years. So um, in the next 15 minutes, I'll introduce you to the topic and go to the different chapters of my thesis. Imagine this installation to be our society and you, me, and the organizations and institutions we are part of and surround us are the independent but interconnected elements depicted as the little squares of this installation. And based on our idea of the world, we continuously move and interact and through this interplay, we balance our society on our wider environment, being the trunk of this installation. But it may be no news for you that this foundation is at its limits. Climate change and biodiversity loss and social inequalities are just a few of the societal challenges we're facing today. And I felt deeply engaged with creating a better world for future generations. And I decided to put my efforts to understanding how businesses can act as a force for good. Because as powerful actors with far reaching contributions to many of the challenges mentioned before, they have a key role to play in the sustainable development of societies. And it is exactly this perspective of businesses as a force for sustainable development that was the starting point of my thesis. So one of the most promising ways in which business can innovate and take up this role is through innovating sustainable business models. This is about transforming the existing ways of maximizing products and revenues at the costs of our natural and social environment towards models that equally balance social and environmental value. Because if imagine if environmental quality or social equity is valued as the most profitable on the long term, how will that op open up opportunities for new and more innovative business models? An example is workwear company Arvego. Um, as their workwear and the textiles uses land, water and energy, um, that puts a high burden on our natural environment. Arveco um, as a model where it uh, radically decreases the use of textiles as they sell their workwear only by piece instead of a full package. And they repair and refurbish and remanufacture their workwear as often as possible. Another example is Homey, which makes washing machines use less energy and last longer through a paper use model. So as a consumer, you don't buy a washing machine, but you pay per wash. And as higher temperature washes are more expensive, it nudges consumers towards more energy efficient behavior. At the same time, it enhances the accessibility of these energy efficient appliances by removing the purchase and repair costs. And the third example is Carbion, which uh, is a company that has developed a direct carbon capture and storage uh, device that helps us to clean up um, and decrease the critical carbon levels in our atmosphere. So whilst there are a few examples, unsustainable business models are still the status quo. So I wondered why that was. And what I found was that the innovation of sustainable business models is difficult because it does not only require changes on the company level, but value chain stakeholders have to align too. So in the example of Arveco, um, the supplier needs to work with long lasting materials and the customer needs to trust that it will always be fulfilled in its needs, even though it's not purchasing anything. Um, and the difficulty here lies in motivating stakeholders to engage and align while they may have no initial incentive to do so. For example, when sustainability is not a priority of the firm or when the benefits land somewhere else in the value chain or when alignment requires significant investments. Therefore, alignment in the wider societal network is needed um, because 
parties in this uh, environment can help to incentivize more sustainable choices. So I think of financing institutes, environmental organizations, end consumers, citizens, but also companies from other sectors, which you might not have been thinking about before. And it is exactly this multi-stakeholder playing field that makes it very complex to uh, develop a model that works for everyone, and it makes the question of how to deal with these processes of stakeholder alignment increasingly relevant. So to better understand these processes, um, I use different theories, and I studied 26 cases of uh, sustainable business model innovation. And in these cases, I specifically focused at the observable events, such as what is being said or done, but I also looked at unobservable events, such as perceptions of what is valuable or feasible. And I tried to discover the underlying mechanisms and structures that might uh, contribute to the construction of these perceptions, such as supplier-consumer relationships. This resulted in a theoretical contribution of a framework that helps to navigate stakeholder processes and a tool that helps business to get started in the first steps. So one of the key findings that I had is that the innovation um, of sustainable, um, sorry, <laughs> one of the key findings was that under the surface of stakeholder organizations lie organizational boundaries. And it is exactly the resistance, these organizational boundaries and the resistance to these boundary changes that make it so complex to develop a model. Um, central to the framework is the need to change the boundary of identity. So this is about the mindset and the purpose of the organization. And traditionally, the identity is focused on generating profits. In a sustainable business model, this more equally balances social and environmental uh, values in addition to the economic value. The second boundary is the boundary of power, which deals with the autonomy of the organization, so the ability to influence others. And whereas traditionally value chains are organized rather fragmented, fragmented around uh, one or two powerful actors, sustainable business model innovation requires a more equal uh, balance of power and thinking in the power of a network. Third is the boundary of competence, which deals with uh, materials, resources and skills that a company possesses. And in sustainability, it, um, there is a need to adopt new competences, such as uh, sustainable design, repair, um, the ability to sell added value or to measure impact. And the last boundary that I observed was the boundary of efficiency, which is uh, it deals with the distribution of activities between stakeholders. So these are typically the make or buy decisions that are being made. And also here, of course, there are new activities to be adopted, such as reverse logistics, uh, reparation, refurbishment, or remanufacture activities. And these boundaries affect each other within and between organizations. So the boundary of identity sets the scope for activities on the efficiency level and vice versa. And if that is not enough, they also affect each other within stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder environment. And when these boundaries remain under the surface or are not being explored, um, they can lead to an obstruction and conflict and sometimes even an ending of the collaboration. So um, it is important to discover these boundaries through a process that I coined boundary work. So I further tested and revised this framework in the case of Nice Granico, which I followed for two years. Traditionally, a pig feed producer producing uh, pig feed and selling it to farmers, um, they changed their focus towards the entire network and thereby found an opportunity for a sustainable business model that would diminish the use of raw materials and increase animal welfare. Um, and to develop this model, they started reaching out to stakeholders that were new to them, such as environmental organizations, retailers, butchers, um, and they even changed their name and logo and started experimenting with picking up waste streams themselves. But this process also confirmed for me the need for mutual alignment and building trust in a um, changing group of stakeholders that is, are not all um, that enthusiastic about doing things differently. As you see here, there's the butcher putting Nice Granico back in their old role, or uh, there's an environmental organization that lauded the idea, but was uh, 
uh, had strict requirements on their, uh, uh, well, for the requirements to attach their name to it. Still, the cases help to distill nine activities of boundary work divided over three phases, exploring, brokering, and implementing. And throughout these phases, stakeholders question what they find important, what they're willing to adjust, and how they can help each other to align. And based on whether the innovation is perceived as attractive or unattractive, there was a strategic sequence of uh, developing and using boundary arrangements in the form of boundary spanners, boundary objects, and physical or digital boundary spaces. But I also saw the limitation of a single company to align an entire network. So I tested how an intermediary can help businesses into their boundary work. I followed the case of CSR the Netherlands, who was involved in a project of using uh, plastic household waste in uh, new products and processes. And what I saw was that they were particularly valuable in the exploration phase by uh, engaging businesses um, in, in circularity and sustainability and help them reflect on their own organization and um, finding potential allies. They were, however, less prominent in the brokering and implementing phases as they did not tailor their boundary work to the different businesses involved or the value chains of these separate businesses. So also here, I concluded that multiple types of intermediaries and even boundary workers are needed. So to engage multiple boundary workers in practice, I felt that a tool was needed. I reached out to st uh, students from Fontes University, and together we developed the Boundary Tool, which features a circle with a central collective ambition that's defined by the uh, participants, and uh, four circles representing the four boundaries. Subsequently, stakeholders can map their changing organizational boundaries as a means to, um, well, by using the organizational boundary cards that comprise uh, typical reconfigurations, examples, and nudging questions. Subsequently, stakeholders can identify matches and mismatches between boundaries. So if a product is designed for disassembly, it help, helps to repair or substitute broken parts. But if a product is to be returned, but there is a make and sell, uh, so a transfer of ownership in place, and that is a mismatch. And based on these mismatches, stakeholders could develop interventions on how they can help each other to align. And this resulted into a collaboration pitch as an appealing narrative which uh, participants can take um, home. So in sum, this thesis provides a sharper view on the potential role of business in society. It forms a plea for better sustainable business model design in terms of reflexivity and inclusivity of stakeholders. Because I've found that sustainable business models do not reach their full sustainability potential if, they, if it neglects the importance of multi-stakeholder alignment. Second, rather than a reconfiguration of products, processes, and revenue models, sustainable business model innovation is also a relational process. And opportunities are not just out there, but they have to be explored and negotiated um, between stakeholders. And also in a process that is not purely transactional, but also relational. Third, boundary work helps businesses to become aware of the need for new identities or new power positions or new competences as essential but often overlooked elements in sustainable business model innovation. And boundary work differs from collaboration because it requires more multifaceted adjustments between more type of stakeholders under larger uncertainties. And last, there is no blueprint of sustainable business model innovation. Designs can be made, but the successful implementation and uh, success of the business model uh, highly depends on the shaping, shifting, and redesign of the organizational boundaries. And the developed framework helps to navigate the stakeholder processes to enhance the chances of a successful sustainable business model. And with these conclusions, this research helps us to move towards a more bright, colorful, and balanced society. Thank you for your attention. I would like to return the word uh, to the pro-rector. Thank you for your presentation. 
The opposition will be opened by Professor Voss, who holds the chair in Supply Chain Innovation at Maastricht University. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Mr. Prorector. Steam candidate, dear Birte. Um, when I, I am um, allowed to open, so first of all, my compliments uh, on your well-written thesis on a very relevant contemporary topic. A lot of companies want to become more sustainable in their operations, yet uh, often struggle to get it done. Uh, so your research provides insights in and guidelines for the tool, for example, uh, corporate journeys towards developing and implementing the required sustainable business models. Moreover, the dissertation really looks beautiful. It really <laughs> does. In line, it's a bit heavy, though. Uh, so, uh, but in line with your topic, and I find the, the, the cover fascinating, and you also explained it. Okay, after these compliments, uh, I would like to raise some questions. Yeah. You sort of expected that, huh? yes, uh, to reflect <laughs> on your results. And I also want to give the paronyms an active role, uh, to get started. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <coughs> uh, because my question is about a combination of propositions nine and seven. So maybe you can do each. Uh, don't fight, please. Uh, <laughs> the one is a bit longer than the other, so, but I would like to start with nine and then seven. Start with nine. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so nine. Uh, so uh, proposition nine is the question, the world looks different after doing a PhD. Yes, okay, keep that in mind. And now number seven. Thank you. You're welcome. Number seven, the psychology of climate trauma should be a field of research, paradoxically, caring too much about the natural environment can lead to despondency and apathy. Yeah, thank you. And uh, in, in Dutch, I think I also had to look it up. Uh, uh, this despondency means like mismoedig, a mm -hmm. bit depressed. And mm -hmm. Okay, I'll come back to that one. Huh? Uh, keep it in mind. Uh, so, uh, but I first would like to go, the, the, uh, that's what they often say, the PhD journey, for me it's quite a long time ago, so, but probably it did change my life. Uh, but in doing so, please reflect, th this is also, you, you haven't seen this, but there's a beautiful, almost game-like overview of, her, of the research process. It's, yeah. it's, I love it. But uh, reflecting on, uh, ch on, on um, um, uh, Proposition 9, mm -hmm. uh, your, uh, so Stelling Neger, uh, that's quite, uh, this process is still quite factual. Uh, so maybe you could say, tell something looking back on all those years, what were the life-changing events in this uh, beautiful model? That's one. But the second one is more important for me, uh, because uh, Proposition 7 is all about maybe the risk of becoming depressed. Uh, so not, not so. that's the paradox you refer to. Eh? So I, I would like to, because you still look very happy, <laughs> uh, also, yeah, yeah, and also on the picture <laughs> in the book, so I think, okay, so apparently you find ways, you found ways to keep those gloomy feelings away, so I would like you to think about and also tell the audience, uh, because hopefully everybody uh, will, will contribute to making our world a better place to live in, so how can they also... Uh, try to avoid such gloomy and depressive feelings. I'm, I'm looking forward to your reflections. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and for your questions, um, which I think are very interesting because um, when I was writing the propositions, I felt that this was something, especially Proposition 9, was something that should have been mentioned somehow um, because I struggled with it, but I also see students and others engage in sustainability uh, dealing with this topic. Um, so maybe I started off a little bit naive five years ago and thinking that if I would uh, put effort into understanding, then there would be an avenue to change. And of course that is because people can change, can learn and can provoke change. Um, for me, the first feeling of despair was after one year and after the first study. And um, I saw that it was very difficult to even find successful examples of sustainable business models, um, except for the obvious ones often discussed uh, and, and yeah, taken out. Um, and that, so at that moment I thought, well, 
let's just keep on working. I will work harder. I had to think of uh, the, the book where the horse is saying. So your uh, initial response was work harder. I will work harder. Yeah. yeah. And that didn't really work. Probably. And it didn't really no. work. No, that's why it took me five years instead of four years eventually. <laughs> so uh, I had to be smarter instead of working harder. Um, but for me, the nice Reinico case was very important. It, it really helped me to see the difficulties uh, and also to pinpoint and understand where the difficulties lies in alignment. And I think without them, I would never be able to have found these boundaries so clear and understand that so clear. And from that moment on, I also felt empowered um, into working and taking this perspective and making it applicable, not only for theory, for understanding, but also for practice. And um, I think these two goals I kept in line for the rest of the years. Um, so uh, you were referring to the paradox, huh? and, and, and I think you already see him here a little bit. Um, on the one hand, I am super enthusiastic about feeling disempowerment and um, that I feel that I can do something. On the other hand, I also see that a single person alone can only do and change so much. And um, whereas in the beginning, I uh, thought uh, I have to be uh, optimistic, and then I went from relentless doomsaying, but they were both quite tone deaf. So um, for now, I decided to just stay in the conversation and try to engage and understand all the different societal actors involved as good as possible. Um, and for me, also being able to use the knowledge and the research that I did as part of my PhD in the Fontes and applied university context also helped me to engage more with students and businesses. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe if I may, one more final. So now you have this unique opportunity, a lot of people that now are enthusiastic and think, okay, we have to do something. What keeps away these depressions? Uh, also it's for me. <laughs> you know, it, um, no, no, no. I mean, if you want to, you, so you want to, it's a paradox. Eh? So you want to do something good. Uh, you want to do this, something with this cli climate uh, movement. And, and but then you, maybe personally you get uh, uh, these, these depressive feelings. So one final word of optimism. Um, just talk about it with each other and uh, generate ideas, even if it's just for your local for your local neighborhood or for your own home or for your friends or just whatever is in the action space of Good. yourself. I, I don't think you should do that now because then I get into <laughs> trouble, but maybe afterwards. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The discussion will be continued by Dr. Planko, who is Professor of Sustainable and Circular Business at University of Applied Sciences in Leiden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, let me first congratulate, with your well, uh, congratulate you with your well-written thesis on sustainable business models and boundary spending. It's a very relevant topic for the systemic change that we need to make to make the sustainability transition work. Um, you managed very well to connect recent theory on the topic with the reality of businesses uh, and business models. And I think your thesis is interesting for both academics as well as for practitioners, and that's a very fine balance uh, to tackle, so you did very well on this. Um, also, I like your book a lot. Uh, it's very uh, visually appealing in, in its design and layout. It was a pleasure to read your thesis. Uh, but of course, I also have some questions. And my first question is about chapter five on intermediary-led boundary work for circular business model innovation. Um, you describe a case study, and in this case study, there's one big uh, intermediary CSRNL, mm -hmm. and you describe this as intermediary has several roles actually, facilitator, matchmaker, maker, and lo lobbyist, and later on also you mention uh, them as a mediator between parties. Um, so my question is, do you think it is possible that several actors carry out these intermediary roles, or is it better, it, like in this case, that there's one actor who carries out several roles? What would be the advantages and disadvantages of both options? Hey, Steve DeVone, and thank you for your compliments and your questions. Um, so if I understand it correctly, um, your questions are first, if um, 
one or one intermediary should do all these roles or multiple intermediaries and second what would be the benefits and mm -hmm. limitations yes. of that mm -hmm. okay well um first of all i think uh, csrnl um did was actually quite effective in what they aimed to do engaging companies with circularity so i think they did that uh, very well and that was uh, a well-written choice but i do think that these tasks that you're referring to um, it can also have different action areas. So uh, in this case, it was a systemic intermediary, which was particularly focused at, um, uh, well, the, the, the business, getting the businesses started. But um, yeah, I kind of mix up the questions a little bit, if you, if you don't mind. So for me, um, the limitation there of one intermediary was that this was their area of action. And, the businesses showed that there are actually multiple areas of action no, uh, needed. So um, also in their distinctive value chains and value networks. Um, I do, however, think that this role could have maybe been fulfilled a little bit better by taking a multi-actor perspective while still work with the businesses themselves. Um, but uh, yeah, so that for me that that and, and maybe that a more explicit focus on boundaries might also have helped to identify potential uh, issues beforehand and to improve matchmaking because that was also now a little bit ad hoc and ex ante. Um, so for me, I think it would be beneficial to involve more type of intermediaries uh, in later stages as well. So particularly for brokering and implementing phases. And I think these kind would be more like process type of intermediaries that are uh, that know the sector very well and 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 the critical parties within there and is able to get them to the table. Um, yeah, of course, a limitation there is uh, well, first having them getting them involved uh, in some some way and um, yeah, and I think also for many businesses it's still. A little bit unusual to think of intermediaries as mm -hmm. innovation has usually been an internal process um, their whole innovation departments uh, working on this yeah and do you think because you mentioned also the different phases and that the cs rnl was primarily very good or good in the first stage so for the second stage the brokering stage and for the implementer uh, impl implementation phase do you then think it would be better if CSR and L, maybe if they had read your book and they had used the tools, <laughs> could they have gotten better results? Or do you think for different phases, also different actors would be necessary? And then who would be the one? Because you already mentioned, maybe it would be businesses, but businesses are not so good at maybe understanding or choosing who would be the right intermediary. Mm -hmm. So who would be in charge of choosing intermediaries if it's not the same one as in the first stage? You know, if you think that someone else is necessary, then who will be the one deciding this? Yeah. Now you're actually uh, pointing at the boundaries of the intermediary itself, which mm -hmm. is quite nice. <laughs> um, so yes, actually, I am almost convinced that the process uh, would have been at least more uh, societal complete if I quote uh, Henk Diepemaat, who's probably somewhere here in the hall, uh, his uh, words, but uh, at least like consider uh, the societal uh, stakeholders as well, because that of course also affects the realization of the businesses involved uh, of their position in the wider network, and which I assume that would also uh, enhance their feeling that it is needed to involve uh, more type of businesses, even from other sectors, or, on, or hire an intermediary for their specific case, as, as one uh, case study did. Um, so I think actually there is a role for a, a systemic intermediary like this to nudge them into taking a multi-stakeholder perspective and getting them the feeling um, that there is more than just suppliers and consumers. Yeah. Maybe one tiny question. It, on based on follow up, following up on this, who then, because I totally agree with you with this, that someone should be the intermediary, but who would in practice then choose this person? You know what I mean? Or this? Yeah, that's a very good question. Mm. I also don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, th so there is no central uh, governing uh, actor in this case. Eh? Mm -hmm. So that's actually the whole problem with sustainable development. Um, and that counts here just as the same. If I think of the Groot Vroomshoop, which was one of the cases in the study, uh, they hired it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, then 
the focus will be on the sustainable business model innovation that they envision. And boundary work ideally is more open. It's not geared to a single outcome, but it is more about exploring together potential new positions. Um, yeah, so I actually I hope that almost every stakeholder that is involved in some way feels the necessity uh, that such a party is needed. Okay, thanks a lot. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Claude, who is associate professor of Open Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Technische Universiteit Eindhoven. Oh, is it on? Thank you, Mr. Prorector. So, dear doctoral candidates, dear mister, uh, with great pleasure. My mic is broken, I think. It constantly switches off. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, with great pleasure and interest, I've read your dissertation about the processes that businesses and their stakeholders go through in pursuit of sustainable business model innovation. And through empirical and theoretical research, this thesis shows that the innovation of a sustainable business model is really a journey, right? In which uh, processes of stakeholder engagement and alignment for sustainable business model innovation can be better understood through boundary work. And I think thereby you provide several interesting theoretical insights as well as practical implications. So your study really enlarges our understanding of an important phenomenon and makes a valuable contribution to the field. So my, my compliments for that. However, despite your rich analysis, I still have some questions left. And one of my questions is related to the discussion section of chapter six. And there you mentioned that the theoretical contribution of the tool lies in the integration of a multi-stakeholder boundary work perspective uh, to existing sustainable business model innovation approaches, and then its translation into entrepreneurial linguistics. And you argue that the tool has the potential to integrate both value-based network and business model innovation approaches with effectuation approaches. And depending on the sequence also of boundary mapping. However, yeah, you do not further explain this potential in detail. So I, my question consists of two parts. Can you provide one or two examples in which you explicitly show how the tool integrates value-based network and business model innovation approaches with effectuation approaches? Mm -hmm. That's one. And then second, can you then explain the theoretical contribution of that integration? And so does the fact that you integrate boundary theory and entrepreneurship theory confirm or dispute the current state of knowledge identified in the literature regarding sustainable business model innovation? Or does it maybe highlight issues that are still unresolved? And so in other words, what's new based mm -hmm. on your, this integration? Yeah, well, highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your compliments and nice words. Um, if I understand your questions correctly, it is uh, first of all about providing some examples about effectuation and value-based innovation, yeah. and second on what the theoretical contribution of that is. Yes. Yes. Um, so maybe just also for the audience here, so um, values-based innovation is uh, one of the ways um, which is uh, presented in the literature to innovate sustainable business models, starting from uh, more normative values of what we find important, such as equity um, uh, or uh, being precautious um, if we, uh, for future generations. And effectuation, uh, how I understand it, is, is almost um, uh, is an approach to just start and start by experimenting and by doing. And um, as this boundary work framework integrates the identities uh, all the way through to activities on the efficiency level, it kind of interlinks these two approaches. And the boundary tool centers these four circles. And um, actually, I did a few of the uh, trial sessions where I started with the boundary of identity. So that is very much uh, focused on what we find important, uh, what would be uh, a mission and vision of our organization and, uh, well, how does that translate into a collective uh, ambition? Um, and, and other trial, uh, trial runs, I started with the efficiency boundaries because I was uh, a little bit anxious on whether the normative would be too abstract uh, for the businesses. So um, there we would start with, okay, what has to change in the value chain uh, for you to enable uh, sustainability? And um, 
so the one hand is, uh, for example, um, an example of a value, yeah, well, the values I just mentioned, but for efficiency, it's, uh, for example, on well, products need to be returned. Uh, otherwise, we cannot uh, uh, repair them or remanufacture them or you know, put them uh, to good use uh, somewhere else. Um, that, that these, um, the interlinkage, I think the theoretical contribution of this in what's new is that it interlinks these aspects. And it therefore um, creates some kind of tool to hold each other accountable for what we were saying or what we were striving for in the identity level, so the values that, we, that were just discussed, um, and if the actions are aligned with that. And I think to date I've not seen uh, any theory that does that this uh, comprehensively within organizations and between organizations uh, in this context. So I would say that is the theoretical, but also the practical uh, contribution. Okay, clear, thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor van der Meer, who holds a chair in sustainability of chemicals and materials at Maastricht University. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, it is uh, with great pleasure that I've uh, read your thesis. What a beautiful book you have created. A great design, I, I love it. Mm -hmm. And also the topic, journeying towards sustainable business models is very close to my heart. I work in a slightly different but related field. Uh, and your thesis provides valuable contributions in this area. Um, so I want to congratulate you with that. I'm also keen to ask you uh, some questions. And uh, well, my, my first question is about sustainability. That may be trivial or maybe not. So um, it relates to chapters three and seven, but also a little bit to your thesis as a whole. Um, for instance, on page 138, you state that most apparently external stakeholders needed to adjust their own operations to innovate the sustainable business model. But you also added to this sentence, which is true for many business model innovations. So first of all, I would like to ask you, in your view, what is the difference between a sustainable business model and a normal business model? Mm -hmm. um, you have explained it a little bit in your introduction, but when you were starting this thesis, you had to make a choice. So when did you call a, sustainable, uh, a case a sustainable business model? Yes, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments. Um, I understand your question as the difference between a traditional business model and a sustainable business model, and based on that, how I applied that in finding case studies. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, innovation is intrinsically about change. So both business model and sustainable business model innovation is about changing the value proposition, the value creation and the value capture um, of uh, the business model. Um, however, in sustainable business models, it's more um, uh, the, the value proposition uh, comprises the multiple elements of social and environmental value. But, and it, that for me wasn't that, that distinctive, but where I saw the major distinction is in the value creation and delivery uh, network. So um, who is actually involved in developing and creating this value? And um, sustainable business models for me, uh, I found that they can only be really sustainable if they involved uh, the whole value chain and even beyond. Uh, so also the environmental organizations who could strengthen the, the propositions for others. And I've not seen that um, so explicitly in a conventional business model. Um, but this also translated in a different value capture revenue because there was higher uncertainty about how this business model would eventually turn out and how profitable it will be. And um, I think in conventional business model, innovation costs and benefits can be uh, well, quite well uh, calculated. Here, that was more challenging because it required more transparency. Um, I think the case of DSM Niaga was exemplary for this, where they, uh, Niaga, together with their potential customer, mapped the costs and benefits uh, over multiple life cycles of their carpet, which was mm -hmm. not usual by then. Um, and so along with this, there is also the acceptance of new and more dependencies. 
And traditional business model innovation is also about strengthening your own competitive strategy. And sustainable business model is also accepting and negotiating new dependencies and um, actually helping everyone uh, align to make it work. Um, so this was for me also translated in some requirements for when I perceived a case study to be suitable. Mm -hmm. And uh, as this was exploratory, I was looking for front runners in this uh, field. Um, so for me, a multi-stakeholder involvement was a prerequisite. Um, so, and actually I also looked at cases that were in this region or in this country. So because for me, I felt that uh, uh, studying them by actually speaking to them in person or observing the process proved more valuable insights than just having an interview uh, via yeah, for a digital interview. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, more or less. Uh, so you did some like pre-work to figure out what are good uh, case studies. And I also had the impression that you had like front runners in this field. I was quite impressed with uh, the case studies you collected. So this, this purposive sampling that you are referring to in chapter three, does that relate to selecting front runners and those kind of things? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So purposive sampling is sampling, uh, well, for to, f to potentially find what suits the research objective best. And uh, as this is rather new terrain, and I felt that everything, well, not everything, but we, we were still missing an understanding of this multi-stakeholder field and also of these entanglable aspects and not just uh, the business model uh, designs. And, and well, at this, and what maybe is nice to mention that I also saw this design implementation gap and I saw literature emerging on that. So how can we bridge this gap? And therefore I thought, I saw the key in multi-actor uh, engagement and boundary work, and therefore um, that strengthened me in uh, yeah, taking this perspective. Thank you. Yeah, and then I have one uh, somewhat related question to this. So you, most of your thesis, it's called sustainable uh, business model innovation, but you have one chapter where you focus on circular business models. Yeah. Do you expect any differences? You do not really reflect on this in your yeah. thesis. Yeah, d definitely. I expected differences, um, but in a positive way. So uh, circular economy is, uh, well, one of the key strategies for sustainable development and is a sub seen as a subset of sustainable business model innovation. Um, so this is, from, from my perspective, this is about the narrowing and the closing and regenerating of material flows. And we tend to think about the circular economy in a rather material technical way. And um, for me, learning from the Nysiganiko case that there was also a lot about power and about dependencies, I felt that studying cases of an intermediary as perceived experts in boundary work um, in a case that I had the feeling tended to focus on the technical aspects, for me, was a very uh, valuable uh, avenue because it might uh, strengthen me in uh, seeing that there was more needed than just um, the, 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 the hard part of the innovations. Um, yeah, so, that's, uh, for, so for me, that was only yeah, particularly interesting to study. Yeah, I understand, but um, uh, does it also give differences related to your results? So can I use your results? all your results for circular businesses or not? Um, yes, I think they are all usable. And um, it actually, they're, they're, the results only improved because of that, because it showed the importance of uh, power and identities uh, as well. And um, what maybe is, is useful for businesses is that there are examples of circular aspects now, which is, are very recognizable uh, for them. So in that sense, um, I think it's, it's beneficial and it does not uh, affect the core of the framework, which is, it's only strengthened in that sense. Yeah, I had the impression that for circularity, it becomes even more important, your, your work. Um, but I don't know if you agree with me and that it would uh, yeah, be more beneficial even for circular businesses business models than for like normal sustainability business uh, models, or you don't agree with yeah. that? Yeah. But you do not really reflect on this in your thesis, like. Oh, how did, yeah, no. Um, well, 
I, I don't really understand what their question. Well, you said it was an interesting case for you to study, but the results, are they also more relevant for circular business models or you think yeah, it's so not for the me, case? Yeah, indeed, definitely. So I think the results why is that? of this study uh, only strengthen the usability of this framework and the relevance of this framework. So, um, In what sense? Can you be specific? Um, in the sense that, um, particularly for circular economy, it is needed to take a systems view on your stakeholders and that it is needed to discuss, um, uh, well, the material strategies, but also the impacts of that, of what, would, what would be needed to implement these um, in terms of new contracting or new purposes uh, or new competences or infrastructures that have to be developed. Okay, thank you. <laughs> The opposition will be continued by Dr. Dijk, who is Assistant Professor of Innovation and Sustainability at Maastricht University. Thank you for the words, dear candidates, dear uh, Mirte. I can only echo the compliments that have been given already about your, uh, yeah, your thesis and your uh, contribution, both in a theoretical sense and a practical sense, uh, also supported by a broad range of uh, empirical work. So I think that's very strong. Uh, also, on a personal note, it's a pleasure to have seen your journey from a, a master's stu a student uh, times now to the moment that you're presenting and debating your own thesis. Um, but I'm also hired here to ask for uh, critical reflections, so I will do that. Um, and um, my question actually uh, connects to uh, what uh, um, uh, Professor van der Meer was already raising. And that is the, uh, the question of how you define sustainability and maybe uh, circularity as well, but let's say sustainability. Um, so in, in, in chapter three already, you have uh, compared uh, the traditional business models and the definition of those uh, with uh, sustainable business models. Um, and uh, in your uh, thesis, you have very strongly focused uh, on the process of uh, developing uh, and designing these business models. Uh, and uh, a big strength is to open this up for multi-sector, uh, multi-actor situations. Uh, but what you have uh, not said a lot about uh, is about the aspect of, of impact uh, of these business models and uh, assessing uh, the impacts both maybe in times of, uh, of designing the business model or at the later uh, stage. So that sort of relates to the question of how sustainable uh, it all is. So in the field of sustainability science, uh, we are proposing a multi-criteria analysis, multi-criteria assessment, uh, as opposed to the more traditional cost-benefit uh, cost analysis uh, that uh, businesses uh, would do uh, in the traditional uh, business model sense. And uh, uh, traditionally, there would be a very isolated uh, calculation. Every business itself would look to uh, its benefits and its costs and investments. Uh, but you have opened this uh, in a multi-actor situation. Um, I think you still agree with me that uh, multi-criteria analysis uh, is, a, is a useful tool uh, in this context. Uh, but my question is how exactly? Um, because you have described these additional dimensions in a sustainable uh, business model case. So not only economic value, but also social and environmental value. And how exactly can we make sure that this uh, additional value is delivered? Do you sort of propose that every uh, organization, every actor in the sort of network that you examine uh, would perform its own multi-criteria uh, analysis? Um, or should this be a sort of orchestrated process, maybe by this sort of central uh, actor that was uh, uh, mentioned earlier on? Uh, would it be one? a collective MCA and who would decide about, uh, about the criteria and uh, so could you uh, reflect uh, on, on the potential use of multi-criteria analysis to make sure that actually these business models are going towards a sustainable future. Esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments um, and your many questions. <laughs> um, I will take two elements of your explanation and just 
highlight it a little bit because I think it influences uh, the answer. So um, in your argumentation, you were talking about impact and how impact can be taken into account in whether already in the design phase or later on. Um, I think if you talk of impact, that uh, which you talked about as social and environmental, which is totally true, but it's not the focus of this research. So the proof of concept of this research is not that the sustainable business model is successful, but that the stakeholder relations and processes have started successfully. Um, so in those terms, I would say impact is on, uh, um, well, having these people in the room and involved in the conversation. So on a more, with a more open outcome. And um, I think that is where the added value uh, lies. And if along the process, which is very iterative, it's definitely not linear, um, if we would notice that this, that there is not enough value delivered, so a good business model design without uh, enough value or, or alignment from stakeholders uh, remains just a design. Um, a bad business model design with alignment is rather fragile, so also there it is important to keep in touch and keep the conversation going about how value can be enhanced. And um, I think Therefore, I would say impact and value is more actor related than that is something um, that is outside of us. Um, your question about the multi-criteria analysis also aligns uh, with this. So um, depending on who is involved, these criteria might change. So um, I think a multi-criteria analysis in itself does not per definition lead to action, but it is the parties who are involved that make sense of it and uh, uh, yeah, uh, link act their actions to it. So in that sense, I think it's very important to determine these criteria together. And um, because I think already that conversation would be a really interesting conversation on not just the costs and benefits, but also on perspective uh, roles and, uh, well, um, maybe fruitful avenues uh, for uh, these parties involved. So um, I also see that here is quite, that theoretically, that would be interesting. I see that in practice, businesses are often not aware of multi-criteria analysis or even of involving stakeholders. Um, that's why I needed purposive sampling <laughs> in the first place. Um, so I think there is still a big theory practice gap to bridge here, which might also be interesting for future work, because I remember I asked this question four years ago to a colleague at MSI if they had ever seen sustainability assessment in that sense, and the methods for that applied in a business context, um, which they had not. So um, I think there is still some work to do. Yeah, let's work on that. Yeah, thank you. So we're at the, at the end of the first round of opposition, but we're not done yet. So uh, um, normally we go back to uh, number one in the rank order of opposition, but uh, Professor Voss has gracefully offered to uh, pass on this opportunity to give more room to our guests from outside of uh, Maastricht University. That means we move uh, back to uh, Professor Planko for the second round. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prorector. Um, my next question is about chapter four, uh, boundary work for collaborative sustainable business model innovation. And on uh, page 62, you have a beautiful overview of the competencies, uh, one of them being the boundary of power. Uh, and here you describe this as a sphere of influence for the organization and a str a strategic control. And um, it's also about realignment of the business in the network context. Um, and here the empowerment of particular actors. Uh, what you also describe and what I see myself also uh, in the field is um, that there's a, a tension between power, of power division, because usually if you empower someone else, it means you have less power. Uh, and this uh, I see as a big tension and you also describe it. So uh, my question here is um, if one actor gets more power, he also has to probably, someone else has to give up power and how do you work, how do you deal with this tension? And do you have uh, solutions for this dilemma? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you for this 
interesting question. Um, I do not have clear cut solutions for this dilemma, um, but I agree with you that this is where I see a major complication lies. And uh, I think there are, um, well, increasingly studies addressing this topic, such as Flora Avellino uh, working on the power in transitions. So uh, I do recognize this as well. And um, what I saw here in the case of Nysigranico, which is the specific case uh, that's related to this chapter, is that um, it's, it's also, it's about stamina, it's about involving others in creating a stronger message and a stronger proposition uh, to the most powerful actor. And um, what, I, what I found that they did really well is to couple uh, the, the, the higher boundary issues like power and identity to issues on the efficiency and competence level. And uh, also, um, Create, yeah, creating a narrative around the importance of aligning with this business model for a future successful organization, in this case, the retail. Um, so in that sense, I would say if dealing with power issues, think about uh, how to design your boundary objects, whom to involve and who to involve in this uh, uh, yeah, message and this search as well. And um, well, maybe there are other ways to also deal with this in terms of uh, creating a more uh, security or a longer term perspective in terms of, uh, well, to shift, uh, to dampen the risks uh, a little bit, because in the end, power is also just about it, about making yourself as independent as, possi as possible. And uh, so I think engaging in the conversation and providing some security in another way might maybe help to, uh, well, at least change the thinking about uh, position of, of yeah, I really factor. like uh, that you say to also show the other people, the, maybe those who have to give up power, that they get something in return. Not power, but then they get uh, efficiencies and other things. Exactly. And that yeah. maybe also relates to your question back, uh, then showing that uh, those benefits. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I agree with you that also this is really a transition. I, I think. Um, if I would extrapolate uh, the power issue a little bit, it's also about empowering sustainable business models in a non-sustainable uh, wider context. Um, yeah, and, but also there, I mean, um, the context can be changed in the end. If I think of uh, electric vehicle sharing in cities, for example, like five years ago, we were not, uh, well, the, uh, we, we didn't think think of it yet, and now it's common in the major cities, or uh, legislation is changing on, uh, for example, the amount of reused plastics uh, as a result of what initiatives uh, encountered in their trajectory. So um, I do feel hopeful in that sense, that also on that scale, um, it will be changed, but it will take a lot of new practices and new ideas, and yeah, also individuals, um, changing their assumptions. And, and I think there is no one in this room who has not had uh, like, um, how do you say it? Fortschreitend mm. inzicht and change their, uh, change their assumptions and opinions uh, after a while. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. The final question in this opposition will be asked by Dr. Claude, please. Thank you. Uh, due to time, I tried to really shorten my question. Um, your main research question is how can business innovate sustainable business models through aligning stakeholders, right, within a network? And although your work offers some worthwhile insights, I'd like to um, trigger you a little bit um, by arguing that this is just one side of the coin, um, especially for those organizations that are developing multi-stakeholder network around part breaking value propositions, uh, which propos propositions related to sustainability often are. Um, another major challenge is to achieve the viability of the network in its broader socio-technical environment. Um, so I skip a part, <laughs> and just by arguing that in developing a multi-actor network for path-breaking value proposition, internal alignment is not sufficient. And that might be the reason that you mentioned it in your presentation, where we still see unsustainable business models being the status quo. And so, Successful networks also arise from a social technical fitness or external viability. What is your reaction towards this viewpoint? And if you agree, how do you think you can extend your tool? Mm -hmm. oh, 
Goliath. Mirte Velter. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis in your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The meeting is adjourned. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the Skills Lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their gym semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Chemlock campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project that includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round but you get to use to it quickly. 
and having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while.
We reopen the session. Mittefelder, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Dr. Bitzer is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in, in accordance with Dutch university custom. And afterwards, Professor Kemp will speak the laudatio. I invite your supervisor to take the floor. Thank you. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific at all times, to be honest and careful, transparent, independent, and responsible. I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee present here, I hereby confer upon you, Mirte Gertruda Elisabeth Felter, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. PhD is een kwestie van vallen en opstaan. <lacht> maar je bent de eerste student die ik ken die van haar paard valt en maar maanden moest revalideren. Vanuit je bed uh, werkt je nog aan een voorstel over hergebruik van zonnepanelen. Dat typeert je, gedreven en enthousiast. Misschien ook wel eens iets te enthousiast en uh, iets te gedreven, net als je paard Fury. Um, je staat hier met een grote lach, hè? alles is goed gekomen. Je hebt een heel goed proefschrift geschreven waar veel waardering voor is. All is well, that ends well. Het was een tijdje zoeken naar de juiste, naar de juiste concepten. En, uh, nou, die heb je gevonden, ook door de interactie met, uh, met, met anderen... Verena Henk, ja, Henk, die hier ook is. Um, John Geurts van uh, Nijsse Garnico, die hier geloof ik ook is. Um, ja, je hebt actief de, hè, de, de interactie met de praktijk opgezocht en je hebt ook gewerkt vanuit, uh, vanuit de theorie. Um, nou, het boundary work kader staat als een huis. Hè, het is vanuit de theorie en, en de praktijk ontwikkeld en dat levert meestal de beste resultaten op. En jouw oog voor details en zorgvuldigheid waren zonder meer een succesfactor. Ik had altijd veel vertrouwen in je en uh, dat is ook uitgekomen. Je deed sommige dingen ook heel slim. Je maakte bijvoorbeeld heel actief gebruik van je begeleiders. Met goed voorbereide meetings, één op één of met z'n drieën. En um, nou, de laatste sessie die ik me nog herinner ging over de vragen die, die mensen <laughs> mogelijk zouden kunnen stellen. <laughs> Dus, uh, nou, daar heb ik toen ook nog met je mee, mee, mee samen gezeten. En er was één vraag die gesteld werd, als ik het nog goed geteld heb. Uh, nou, er waren de nodige tegenslagen, maar die overkwam je. Je toonde veerkracht waar, waar anderen het misschien opgegeven zouden hebben. En uh, dat is absoluut een kwaliteit. In het begin leek je niet zo geïnteresseerd in theoretische concepten. Maar je werd steeds nieuwsgieriger om de zaken ook theoretisch te duiden en concepten met elkaar te verbinden, om, uh, om praktische inzichten die je ook vergaard had uh, te kunnen verklaren. De puzzelstukken vielen eigenlijk steeds beter op hun plaats. 
Hou je van puzzelen of is dat uh, <laughs> iets wat je niet kunt laten? Een, uh, een compulsie. Uh, hou je van puzzelen? Goed, I guess. <laughs> of maak je dingen soms ook te ingewikkeld? Nou, hoe dan ook, je leert een originele theoretische bijdrage. Het is al gemenoreerd, die relevant is voor de praktijk. Bedrijven kunnen er iets mee. Ze herkennen het belang van nieuwe rollen. Identiteit en ook acceptatie van afhankelijkheden. Um, je was heel actief betrokken bij de uh, casus Nijse Ganico. Uh, in het begin dacht ik ook wel eens <laughs> van, nou ja, jij hoeft het allemaal niet te bedenken en op te lossen. Maar wat een eenvoudig idee leek... Uh, het is niet zo gememoreerd dat, uh, dat uh, ja, supermarkt-etensresten uh, die dan gaan dienen als varkensvoedsel, bleek in de praktijk helemaal niet makkelijk. Uh, het mocht geen cent duurder zijn, partijen wilden zelf zo min mogelijk doen, zelf doen. En ik weet niet of John Gertz het weet, maar wij spraken van de soap van food for feed for food. <laughs> een andere soap, of misschien niet zozeer een soap, maar... <laughs> Een soort van horrorverhaal was de huisrenovatie, waar de kozijnen, als ik het me goed herinner, verkeerd verplaatst werden en nou ja, daar ook iets hersteld moest worden. Er was altijd wel iets geks aan de hand in je leven. Gelukkig uh, ja, kwam je toch, ja, ken ik jou als iemand met een big smile en een optimistische inborst en heel veel veerkracht. Je stond open voor de suggesties van anderen, maar werkte ook zelfstandig en dat is een uh, hele goede combinatie. Nou, de laatste stelling van je proefschrift is al gemenoreerd. The work looks different after doing a PhD. Daar mag je zelf wat over zeggen. Misschien later vandaag nog. Um, ik eindig met een andere quote die ik van toepassing acht op jou. En dat is de volgende. Ik ben even vergeten waar, van wie die is. Maar uh, de quote is... Push your boundaries beyond the ordinary. Be that extra in the extraordinary. <laughs> nou, heel veel mensen zijn gekomen en dat is natuurlijk niet toevallig. En dat is omdat jij die buitengewone persoon bent die je bent. Ik vond je een fijne PhD-student en ik hoop nog veel met jou te, te, te gaan doen. Dat geldt ook voor Verena en Nancy. Uh, we hebben dit ook een beetje samen. Zo. Uh, de, de laudatie is ook iets van ons drie eigenlijk. Ik weet niet of je een feestvierder bent... Maar het moment van feestvieren is nu aangebroken. Uh, geniet van de rest van je dag. Je mag trots zijn op wat je gerealiseerd hebt. Het overtrof mijn verwachtingen en ik denk ook die van jezelf. Gefeliciteerd. Dank je wel. Dear Dr. Velter. Also, on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. This ends the formal ceremony. However, I have a few words to say also to the audience. Um, so, dear audience, you have been very attentive and uh, uh, silent, so that's very appreciated. And you have passed on the lunch, I think, for mo at least most of you. Uh, it's time, as uh, Professor Kemp said, to party, so the reception will be at the Tribunal, which is, if you do not know Maastricht, just out of the front door of this building and then straight on and down, and then you cannot miss it. Uh, you're invited to go there already. Uh, meanwhile, the committee and uh, Dr. Felter and Aparanims will uh, take a few minutes to uh, take a picture on the stairs. Thank you for being here.